Hello there. We are in this series looking at uh, how to read the Bible, how to understand God's word for us. And as we begin today, we're going to hear a section of Paul's letter to Timothy, read by John Bishop. Timothy, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It's of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. You know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. This is the Apostle Paul near the end of his life, writing some real heartfelt words to his fellow worker and protege, Timothy. And he has some real words of encouragement as well as instruction. In fact, this whole letter, Paul's second letter to Timothy, is full of personal advice from an older Christian to a younger Christian. He warns of people who will come amongst the church and try to lead people down the wrong path into godlessness. He warns them against pandering to people's wishes and saying things just to make them feel good. Instead, he urges Timothy to persevere in proclaiming the truth he has been grounded in from his youth and which will equip him for his life now and into the future. Paul is convinced that the Bible contains all we need to become wise for salvation and that through its study, we can be thoroughly equipped for living for God. But he also recognises that it is possible to misinterpret the Bible and that its words can be twisted and used to lead people astray. He warns Timothy that the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of other teachers to say what their itching ears 
want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to half-truths and myths. So here's Paul's specific instruction to Timothy in regard to this. Do your best, he says, to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. God's approval goes to those who correctly handle the word of truth. So we need to learn to correctly handle God's word and not wander from the truth. And I think in a time such as this, we need to really heed this instruction. Many people are turning to the Bible to find explanations for the current crisis facing our world. Is it a judgment uh, of God due to some global sin? Is this what was predicted in Revelation as a sign of the end times? Why has God allowed this to happen? Where is God in all this? Unfortunately, the answers to these questions are not explicitly found in the pages of the Bible. But I do believe we can find answers as we seek to read the word of God intelligently with discernment and humility. Which is why I think this series on how to read the Bible is so important. I read something the other day about a Jewish rabbi who was asked whether he thought coronavirus was an act of God, a bit like the plagues on Egypt in Exodus. His response was no. The act of God occurs, he says, when people step up to help one another. That rabbi knew how to read the Bible correctly. Last time, we spent uh, some time thinking how important the context of what we read is, how historical, literary, and biblical context all need to be taken into consideration in order to understand what a particular passage in the Bible means. I also introduced the subject of genre, another technical term, which simply means the type or style of writing. The three broadest categories of genre, which I'm sure you will probably be familiar with, are poetry, prose, and drama. When we read a part of the Bible, we need to recognize what type of writing we are reading. We need to recognize whether the writer is speaking figuratively or literally. We need to recognize whether what we're reading is using picture language or poetry to communicate a point. Last week, we illustrated how some, the same event can be described in different ways. We took an example of the famous Wordsworth poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, and described the scene in narrative form and as a newspaper uh, article. Each had a different style and form, and as we read it, we see telltale signs that help us recognize each. Most simply, we can tell whether it's poetry because it rhymes or uses highly imaginative, flowery language. Poetry is not meant to be taken literally. The newspaper report was a descriptive account of the same event. It may contain some useful facts and information, but it's nowhere near as memorable. The Bible contains lots of different types and styles of writing. Nobody can agree on precisely how many different types of writing there are, but that should not concern us unduly. We just need to be aware that when we read the Bible, we're not reading a book that always communicates in the same straightforward manner. By far the most common genre or type of writing in the Bible is narrative, which is simply a section of literature written to tell or narrate a story. And so, for example, we have the story of Abraham, the story of Moses, the story of Gideon, the story of David and Goliath, the story of Paul's missionary journeys in Acts, and so on. The problem we have to deal with is that when some people hear the word story, they immediately think this is something that has been invented and really ought to be prefaced with the words once upon a time. And there are some stories in the Bible that have clearly been invented. Before any of you think I'm a heretic, 
I'm referring, of course, to the parables, the stories that Jesus told, although it's true to say that there are also parables in the Old Testament. We all take it as read, or at least I hope we do, that there wasn't an actual good Samaritan or a real prodigal son. These were stories that Jesus made up to make a very good point. But then this raises another question in our minds. Which stories, particularly those in the Old Testament, are historical? That is, they actually happened. And which, if any, are like parables intended to teach us something? Well, it's a very good question, and it's one that's impossible to answer with any absolute certainty. People adopt extreme positions on this. Some people would argue that the Bible as a whole is invented. None of it actually happened. It's all fiction. It's all a good story with some meaning and truth and some good principles to live by. But that's all. At the opposite extreme, there are those who insist that everything in the Bible must actually have happened exactly as the Bible says. No argument. I find neither position convincing and believe the truth lies somewhere in between. There are some stories that the biblical writers clearly intend their readers to know that the events described are historical facts. This is particularly the case with the New Testament writers who go to great lengths to present proof and eyewitness reports of the life, death and resurrection of the real person Jesus. Luke, the gospel writer and writer of Acts, clearly is setting out an orderly account of the life of Jesus and the early years of the church following Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And he says as much in the introduction to both his gospel and the book of Acts. And of course, it's vitally important to us as Christians that Jesus did actually die and rise again. As Paul says, if he did not, then we are wasting our times, our time and everybody else's too. But what about the stories such as Job or Jonah or Esther even in the Old Testament? Did they actually happen? Did a real person called Job really suffer all those calamities on the same day? Did he really sit around speaking poetry with his so-called comforters? Did a real person called Jonah really get swallowed by a giant fish or whale that subsequently vomited him up onto dry land? Sadly, we'll never know whether somebody wrote a story or whether they tried to write down an account of events that actually happened to real people called Jonah and Job and Esther. And it's probably not worth spending too much time asking those sorts of questions. In many respects, it doesn't really matter. What matters is what truths we can learn from the story. What does the story tell us God is like? What does the story teach us about trust and obedience and repentance? What can we learn about ourselves or about the world? Or what lessons can we learn about how we should live now? What about other types of literature that there are? Well, when it's not telling stories, the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, gives us letters. As with all letters, we only get one side of the correspondence. So reading a New Testament letter can be a little like listening to one end of a telephone conversation. The New Testament letters are not timeless statements of Christian doctrine, but particular arguments written in response to some specific situation in the first century world. Part of the task we need to engage in when reading the letters in the New Testament is filling in the gaps or reading between the lines. There is one other type of literature that occurs in the New Testament, and that is apocalyptic, uh, the book of Revelation. This type of writing also occurs in the second half of the book of Daniel. Apocalyptic simply means unveiling or revealing, hence Revelation. This type of literature has no modern equivalent with which to compare it. And hence, we have a tendency to try and make it fit into another category that it doesn't want to fit into. Most scholars believe the use of 
bizarre and spectacular imagery, so much a feature of apocalyptic writing, is a symbolic way of highlighting issues of good and evil, written particularly at times when the world at the time uh, was in great turmoil and God's people were suffering great persecution and uncertainty. One thing nearly all scholars are agreed on is that the apocalyptic literature is not a literal account of things to come. Nor is it a code to crack where each symbol stands for something or someone or somewhere. I quite like the succinct summary of the book of Revelation, which is just two words, God wins. The Old Testament is even more of a challenge in terms of the type of literature it contains, some of which have no modern equivalent today. Perhaps the simplest type to recognize is poetry, such as we find in the Psalms, Song of Songs and Lamentations. Wisdom literature focuses on questions about the meaning of life, practical living, common sense, and it contrasts our faulty human wisdom with God's perfect wisdom. The largest body of literature in the Old Testament is prophetic. To our eyes, this type of writing seems a lot like poetry, but it has a particular style and subject matter. Prophecy is the type of literature that is often associated with predicting the future. However, it's also God's words of get with the program or face the consequences. Thus, prophecy also exposes sin and calls for repentance and obedience. It shows how God's law can be applied to specific problems and situations, such as the repeated warnings to the Jews before their captivity. There are also legal codes or lists of laws, such as those found in Leviticus and Numbers, uh, but also in Exodus and Deuteronomy. And then the most riveting of genres, genealogies or family lists. Some people think that the last two genres were included by people who were worried that if reading the Bible was made too entertaining, then people would stop believing it was good for them. It's not an exhaustive list of genres, but these are the main. And it's important to recognize them when we encounter them. And of course, things are complicated by the fact that you can find different genres in a single biblical book. I think the most important thing is that what God is saying to us through any passage will be said in different ways depending on the genre. Different types of writing have to be handled in different ways in order to understand their meaning for us today. We have a habit of breaking up the Bible into nice bite-sized chunks in an attempt to make it more manageable. That works with some parts of the Bible, but not so well with others. For example, you can read a single verse, such as John 3:16 from the Gospels, and its meaning to us is pretty clear much clearer than it probably was to Nicodemus, to whom Jesus was speaking at the time. But if you were to read Leviticus 3, verse 16, you might not immediately see what the message God has for us is. In case you don't know, Leviticus 3, verse 16 says, all the fat is the Lord's. With some genres, you only need to read a few words in order to get the message. For others, you may need to read a lot more to get the meaning. One other thing to remember, in order to understand stories or prophecies, proverbs or poems, legal codes or letters, we really need to read the whole thing. By just reading a part, we risk getting the message wrong or missing the message altogether. I want to finish with an example which may help us to appreciate this point. Many of us will be familiar with the story of Gideon, which is told in the book of Judges. One of the incidents in the story is when Gideon asks for signs from God to confirm God really does want to use him to deliver Israel. Gideon asks God to make a woolen fleece wet and the ground dry overnight. And when this happens, Gideon is still not satisfied and asks for the reverse the following night and God duly delivers. Thus began the long tradition which would surely astonish Gideon, if he knew, of laying a fleece before the Lord to test out what God wants 
Since most of us don't have a handy supply of fleeces, we take this metaphorically and say things like, God, if you want me to give money to the poor, give me a sign. Uh, make me rich. Does the story of Gideon teach us to lay fleeces before the Lord? Is this the message God is giving to us? Not everything in a story such as that of Gideon is necessarily an example of what we should do. Nobody would suggest that we follow the example of Jephthah in Judges 11 when he promises to sacrifice the first thing he sees on returning home from battle. So how should we tell whether laying fleeces before the Lord is a good or bad thing for us to do? Can I suggest that it's neither? Perhaps it's just a record of something that Gideon did. So what does the story of Gideon really tell us? Well, perhaps the main message of the story as a whole is that Gideon, like most of the so-called heroes in the book of Judges, is simply one more person that God uses in spite of their, we in spite of their weaknesses and faults to do great things. Another lesson might be that like Gideon, we need to trust in God and what he says to us. So my prayer for you and for myself is that God might inspire us to explore his word, to take it seriously, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, his divine guide, and with the help of the church family that God in his wisdom has placed uh, us within, we might correctly handle the word of truth as Paul instructs Timothy, recognizing it's not just a case of reading it and then trying to do what it says. Let's pray together. Father, thank you uh, that you have given us your holy word. Thank you that it is an inspired book. Thank you that it has been handed down to us uh, through the generations faithfully Thank you that it, it contains truth. Help us, Lord, to understand it when we read it, to wrestle with those parts that we find difficult rather than just ignore them. Help us to remember that it is useful for teaching, uh, for correcting, uh, for showing us exactly uh, how you want us to live as your people in the world today. So I pray, Lord, that you would give us a hunger, a desire to read it, uh, and Lord, that you would help us to put it into practice. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. So may God bless you and your families and friends and keep you in his care until we meet again.